As you've already heard, my name is David Cruz. I always have the friendly Sararo from Sararo National Park says hello for me, uh, since it's always got its arm up. Uh, all good stories have a good villain, and this is the villain in my story. Uh, my wife, Corrine, who is responsible for uh, almost everything that in, in, a, in an unintended way, almost everything that happened uh, related to the parks from 2012 forward. Uh, we were on our first vacation together visiting national park sites in, uh, to, well, anywhere uh, dedicated to that purpose. We were visiting some Civil War battlefield, battlefields in Eastern Virginia. And uh, I had bored her to tears, giving her a complete verbal history of the, of the events of the Battle of Chancellorsville on the first day. Uh, that was our first stop. I looked over in the car and I saw her eyes had rolled in the back of her head. And the only thing she captured out of all that, that 30 minute retelling of Stonewall Jackson's brilliant strategy to, to uh, basically send the Union Army back across the Rappahannock with their tails between their legs is that David is really happy to be here. So um, in the course of the events that would ensue just in the, in the next 15 minutes or so, uh, I would come in possession of, uh, well, she would first suggest, maybe this is what you should do with your extra time and energy. You should go see the parks. Uh, you seem to really love these places. And that idea kind of latched into my head. And shortly thereafter, I found myself looking at a system map of the entire national park system, 400 plus units large, from coast to coast, Alaska, Hawaii, and the island territories in the Pacific and Caribbean. I noticed as I read all these park titles that maybe two thirds to three quarters were familiar to me, at least in, in some way, but there were probably, there were another quarter or a third that I had never heard of. I, I had no idea uh, what these parks were, uh, the history of them, uh, anything about them really. But I, the idea uh, in my head was, well, I, if I know what Yellowstone Yosemite are, so Pinnacles probably is really interesting too. Uh, when whatever is at Chiricahua National Monument in Southern Arizona is probably really worth seeing. Well, that would turn out to be true and then some. But the idea surfaced that, I wonder if anybody has ever seen all 400 of these places. I was sure somebody had done it. Uh, at this point, somebody's done just about everything, but uh, I didn't really know the answer to that question. I would later learn that as far as we know, only about 50 or so people have made it around all 400 plus parks. Uh, nobody can be absolutely certain, but most people who do choose that as a goal end up finding the National Park Travelers Club, a nonprofit of about 3,000 park enthusiasts across the country and uh, eventually they find that club and they find the their their fellow co-conspirators who have that same park bug and are trying to see all the parks uh ends up that that's a wonderful resource to people in that club for people who are trying to explore the parks uh far more advanced and helpful than a facebook social group uh where you have people commenting on there that have no idea what they're talking about quite frankly um, so it's kind of buyer beware. But Kareem would set all this in motion with her suggestion, and it really was quite brilliant. Sometimes the obvious thing is the most important thing, and that was true. Uh, it, within a few days of us touring these Civil War battlefields, I had made up my mind, I am going to see all 400 of these places come hell or high water. And, it, and I would go through hell and high water in order to get to the end. Um, that's part of a whole different discussion uh, that I do talking about the uh, essentially the story in the book because that's the story I tell in the first book is the experience of visiting all 400 parks and all the things that I encountered uh, from a stand down with a mountain lion at Great Basin National Park to literally walking through a horde of migrating tarantulas at Big Bend National Park and and what was the most amazing about it is you, you would not believe this I never would have tarantulas are actually beautiful little animals if you stop and take your time and of course, you know, don't mess with them. You know, they have no interest in humans as long as you don't mess with them. But um, turns out there's a lot of different species, all kinds of different colors. And, you know, it's kind of fun to watch them scurrying on their way. My final park, there would be 417 when I finished my goal to see all the units of the National Park System. 
Uh, my final park would be reconstruction area National Historical Park, which was not even yet a year old. It had been created in January 2017, uh, one of four new parks created in mid-January uh, in the last weeks of the Obama administration. Wonderful park filled with uh, fascinating layered history about the efforts of the formerly enslaved to integrate into American society. So it has a lot of different angles and all kinds of fascinating stories. One of the greatest American heroes that almost nobody's ever heard of, Robert Smalls, is at the center of the history told in this park. Um, this would be, I, I, while it represented a, a really momentous uh, accomplishment and a special thing, it would just be almost the beginning because once you get through the whole thing, you realize the parks are, are forever elusive and that you never get to the center of the lollipop. Uh, it's, uh, there is always something else to see, another layer. If you talk to rangers that, that are stationed for decades out in large parks in the West or in Alaska, they'll tell you at the drop of a hat, there are parts of this park I have never seen. There are things I discover every day. And even if you do know the park, the nature of them is such, including the historical ones, that our experience has changed. They're all places of change. So you might have a wildlife encounter, you might hear a new story, you might go to one of the parks we talk about in today's talk, uh, which this talk was originally created for the National, Trails, for National Frontier Trails Museum in Independence, Missouri. That would be the point of origin of three of our most significant major national trails. The trails that, that are covered in this particular talk, there are six that form the basis. And I talk about the parks that tell part of their story. That's what today's talk is. Uh, but there are six. They are the Oregon Trail, the, the California Trail, which shares the same path as the Oregon, uh, most, most of the distance till you get out to Idaho and Nevada, where they split. Uh, then you have the Santa Fe Trail, the oldest of those trails, uh, of those main travel routes for the overland migration. You have the Mormon Pioneer Trail, which starts in Nauvoo, Illinois, and ends in Salt Lake. You have the Pony Express National Historic Trail, which starts in St. Joseph, where the home stables were for the Pony Express. Uh, Pony Express was a very short-lived enterprise, uh, soon was made extinct by the telegraph. That, ran, that was able to communicate messages across the country. Uh, but it operated for about a year and a half from St. Joseph to Sacramento, California. Uh, then we have, last but not least, and the oldest of all the trails, though not an overland migration trail, the Lewis and Clark Trail, which starts technically in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, which is where the, the process of getting supplies and preparing for the journey as the core of discovery, as, that, as they would be called, begins. In my own travels through the park system, I was moved by how often people went above and beyond the call of duty to help me understand and explore these places. So coming into the centennial year, I had passed 300 parks, 300 of the parks visited in 2015. I wanted to do something to say thank you to the people who work in the parks. I'm not an artist of any kind. I never thought about writing or speaking about the parks. Uh, that would all come later. Uh, but I wanted to create something that I could give back to the National Park Service as a thank you to all these people. In August 2015, they introduced two promotions which would run concurrently through the centennial celebrations for the National Park Service of 2016. Uh, these were the Find Your Park and Centennial promotions themselves. Part of that were these sets of promotional lapel pins, nearly 500 made in total, representing 248 MPS locations in 46 states and territories. I decided I'm gonna be going to a, a lot of parks over the next year and a half. I'll just make a complete set of these and give them back to the National Park Service as a way to say thank you. If somebody doesn't create one, they'll never have one. As it would turn out, this is the only complete set of these pens that exist. Uh, they were given back to the Park Service to go on tour as a traveling exhibit. They're now in their 16th park host and in their fifth year on exhibit in the parks under the arch in my original hometown, Gateway Arch National Park in St. Louis. They will go to Wilson's Creek National Battlefield and then they'll head way out west and go to Tucson, uh, El Paso and the Grand Canyon. As I was working toward this, I got into the centennial year and I decided, 
I was going to spend the whole year in physically in the parks in 2016. That my way to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, and and those year long celebrations was to be physically in the parks, continue to try to see new parks, but also revisit the parks I had seen before to get more depth, more understanding, to have more experiences or see things I had missed. I'm still doing that. I'm still going back to parks to, to try to find and explore places that I missed in earlier trips. Um, you just never get to the end. Along the way, I was sharing pictures with friends and family on social media, not publicly, but you know, how I hiked this trail, I went up this mountain, I, I, I went through this fort, this is the history of the fort, and these are the, it's a pictorial tour of what I saw. And a growing chorus of people, when the centennial started, I was everywhere. Before that year would finish, I would travel over 146,000 miles to visit parks. I would hike over 700 miles in the park system that calendar year. I would visit 387 of the 400 plus NPS units and travel through all 50 states in the Caribbean territories to do so. Uh, so these people who started noticing I was doing this, they were getting pictures from parks in Georgia one week and Washington State the next, and then California, and then all of a sudden I pop up in Maine, then I'm in Florida, and they're like, what on earth is going on? Because it was obvious these were actually being taken in real time and, and shared. This same group of people said, you need to tell the story, whatever it is you're doing, if, especially if you're going to do it for a whole year. I went into the literature looking, and I'd already looked for this and not found it, and I was able to discover that nobody had ever written any kind of story or narrative that included or introduced the entire national park system. The only kinds of books, stories, narratives, travelogues only introduced or discussed the 63 national parks as designated by Congress. They left out the other 360 and all of our human history. And I thought, what a shame. Uh, I would have loved to have read a book like that to help me understand what it is I'm really getting into and what is it going to be like to go to Guam? Uh, what happens when I go to the Arctic of Alaska? How do I even get to some of these places? And it turns out that's a big part of the story. But uh, I would devote the next two years after the centennial to visiting the last 22 parks I had yet to see and putting the whole experience in writing. And the result of that in January 2019 was the first and still only published narrative that introduces all 400 parks plus parks about the experience of seeing them. We talk about the Western trails and uh, this is a little picture I, I took from part of the exhibit at the Western Trails Museum in Casper, Wyoming. It's a museum dedicated to the four trails that run through Casper and through the state of Wyoming. They clear the Rocky Mountains at the famous South Pass, which is, doesn't look like a pass at all when you see it in person. It's just sort of like a, a really low saddle in the line of the Rocky Mountains. It's a wonderful place for wagons to cross the, the Rocky Mountains and thus it was the path chosen by these four trails that all shared the same path from about a third of the way across Nebraska and the Platte River on west until you get to pass the Continental Divide and the border of Wyoming and then they start to go their separate ways. The Mormon Pioneer Trail continues on to Salt Lake City where the Mormons would make their home in the 1840s when they fled uh, Nauvoo after the death of Joseph P. Smith. The Pony Express follows the same route as the Oregon and California trails. They follow that same path along the, the Platte River through Western Nebraska, across Wyoming, across South Pass, and then they go to the north and eventually split, one heading towards Sacramento and Donner Pass and the other heading to the north and to Williamette Valley and the Columbia River. Uh, but all these trails run together through the whole state of Wyoming, which is why this is an excellent place to talk about our Western trails. We talk about the trails that, that are, part, are, are told in part by the parks that we're gonna mention today. Uh, these are the six trails that I mentioned, and I just put them up here just so you can have an idea of how many people actually traveled these different trails. Uh, and, and that's still debatable to this point. Uh, the, only, the only accurate statement is to say several hundred thousand people made it to California on the California Trail in the wake of the gold rush, which was the true impotence. There was very little traffic on the California in the 1840s until 
gold brought everybody west. Uh, then Oregon continued a steady flow. Um, the, the very beginnings of the Oregon Trail go back to 1836 and the first European-based settlers or origin settlers uh, would come out west in a missionary couple. We'll talk about them a little later in our program. There's a national park site named after them that tells their story. Uh, but they would settle in near Walla Walla, Washington, uh, and, and were the pioneers on what would become the Oregon Trail. And then, of course, the Mormon Pioneer Trail, which was the followers in the Mormon Church that were moving west from the Mississippi River Valley all the way to Salt Lake City and that short-lived Pony Express, which expired in the early months of the Civil War. The farthest point east on any of these trails, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is Harpers Ferry, Virginia. This is a view during the winter time of the Shenandoah River from along the Appalachian Trail. Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, used to be Harpers Ferry, Virginia, uh, sits at the confluence of the Shenandoah and the Potomac Rivers. Uh, it's now protected. Much of the lower town, the old town, is protected by Harpers Ferry National Historical Park, which tells the story of Harpers Ferry dating all the way back to before the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which got its start here at Harpers Ferry. Of course, most people know Harpers Ferry from its Civil War history, its federal arsenal, which was, uh, which was attacked uh, and taken over by John Brown and his sons uh, in 1859. They would be martyred to the cause of extreme abolition uh, in, with his execution in nearby Charlestown. And this really was one of the last straws that broke before the Civil War would change American history forever. But, uh, but there are many other parts of Harper's Ferry story, including that of, of um, Meriwether Lewis passing through here, uh, starting to collect men and materials on his way west. So he's, he's basically moving upwards toward the rivers, and th that will gain serious steam when he combines his efforts with Clark's um, on the Ohio River. And they're steadily going to build up to the numbers that they need in order to do this expedition, the Corps of Discovery, which will begin in earnest with the full complement of men near St. Louis, modern-day St. Louis, Missouri, which is here. Uh, if you've ever wondered where Lewis and Clark were before they headed out west on their core of discovery up the Missouri River. They were right here. That was Camp Dubois, what I just pointed at. Uh, you can't visit it today because it's under the main channel of the Mississippi River. Well, you can, but you'll get wet. And you've got to watch for the barges that are going over. That's a lot of barge traffic passed through. The, the river you see directly across from us is the Missouri. So they made their camp Dubois directly across on the eastern bank of the Mississippi, directly across from the confluence of Missouri. Why did they do that? Because that's, that's where they were headed. Uh, that's where they were gonna start out as soon as they had everything, all their supplies in order with the spring and the turn of the weather. So May of 1804, they would begin their journey west. Uh, they made that camp in December, 12th of 1803 so they would stay there for quite a few months that was uh they could not they not only had to wait for the weather to clear they had to wait for the worst of the flood waters to run past so the snow melt a great deal of that volume of water had to pass through they could not fight either of those rivers uh, back before the corps of engineers made uh spent a great deal of time and energy to tame the mississippi and the missouri uh in the spring at in the heaviest volumes of water, it would not only carry this huge volume of water, but trees and all kinds of other things would come down. Sometimes people's homes would float down the river. And you did not want to be on a raft, especially pulling it on a rope when a whole forest of trees comes down the river at you. That does not end well. Of course, the park that tells part of that story in our national park systems, this one, Gateway Arch National Park. That's its current iteration for those who haven't been a great deal of this museum, and this is a newly, newly uh, uh, mod remodeled, uh, a whole new museum from the original one that sat underneath the arch, which was dedicated to Lewis and Clark. So a primary 
reason for creating Gateway Arch National Park, its original name was Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, was all about Western expansion, which is what the Gateway Arch symbolizes. So it was actually directly tied to Lewis and Clark and their expedition and core discovery headed westward. They would spend the year 1804 working their way up the Missouri River with a lot of fascinating experiences, including their first interactions with the native tribes in the upper and eastern plains that we would call the Sioux. But there were several different nations up uh, the, the Mandan, the Hadatsa, the uh, Hadatsa, who they would spend part of their uh, part of their winter with. Um, the Mandan and Hadatsa had similar similar lineage, a lot of connection between the tribes, and uh, they lived in close in close order. They would they would build their villages. The Mandan became known very well known for these sod huts, uh, which were much more durable in the high or weather extremes that they would experience in the Northern Plains, as opposed to the more nomadic bands of Sioux, like the Lakota Oglala, who would use teepees and would move south during the winter and try to avoid being in North Dakota in the worst of the winter storms. Well, Lewis and Clark couldn't simply go to uh, Marriott or Hyatt and hang out there with their guys. Um, and they certainly were going to sleep in tents. So they built a fort, which they called Fort Mandan. It's been reconstructed very near its original site as a state park in uh, North Dakota. You can go visit it. It's very near, uh, it, the fort was intentionally built right next to a set of Hadatsa and Mandan Sioux villages, which were made of these sod huts. And the truth of the matter is they, they would not have made it through this winter without close support and cooperation from the neighboring tribes, the Mandan and Adatsa, which provided them with foodstuffs and, and knowledge about how to survive the severe weather, the winter that they were experiencing, uh, and, and basically hung out with them for the winter. Uh, so this was a big part of the Lewis and Clark's success and their story. Uh, it's told at Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site in North Dakota. Once they were able to get restarted again in the spring, one of their first points of passage would be the confluence of the Missouri and Yellowstone River, which take place very, very near the Montana-North Dakota state line, not too far away from the Canadian border. That would later, because of that river confluence and the trade that moved through there, become a very significant trading post. Uh, first for furs and then for everything else that had to move out west, uh, both west to east and east to west. Uh, as a result, a fort and a structure would be built there called Fort Union Trading Post. This park is, is rebuilt, or some of it is, is original. Uh, some of the structure and the building is original, but this is, this is Fort Union Trading Post. It sits Actually, the park sits on the state line. So you cross between Montana and North Dakota while you're visiting the park, between the parking lot and the center of the trading post. Uh, this trading post, of course, dates to after Lewis and Clark would have passed through here in the first decade of the 19th century. But it served as a major point and trading post and fort uh, at the Missouri Yellowstone confluence for the better part of the 19th century. In terms of, of National Park Service units, there's the, the next one that comes into play is actually Lewis and Clark National Historical Park, which is the site of, includes the site of their second winter encampment. Uh, so they make it through the Rocky Mountains and they're able to make it out to the Pacific Ocean right before they need to find, they need to start another winter encampment. It would be November when they were fighting their way to this point, which is the Columbia River mouth at the Pacific Ocean. It's one of the most treacherous river mouths in the United States. It is so treacherous in terms of narrow shoals and currents and passageways that are notorious in wrecking ships that for any vessel that wants to pass through this river mouth, they have to be guided by a licensed pilot, a local pilot, in order to, to make it around into the, into the Columbia River or vice versa, get out of the Columbia River, out to the open ocean. Uh, that jetty um, 
that that jetty that you see the Corps of Engineers has built uh, is intended to help guide people away from a no man's land and some of the worst of the shoals that are there along the coast. Lewis and Clark uh, National Historical Park uh, occupies a number of sites near the Columbia River mouth where they had their winter encampment, including a reconstructed fort that's built on the site uh, and uh, some points where they were pinned down on their in their effort to make it out to the ocean before winter would make the whole situation completely impassable. Uh, William Clark would name this point that you see in the picture Cape, uh, Cape Disappointment. <laughs> uh, that pretty much describes his uh, reaction once he got there. I, I, you know, would have to be after everything they went through in the two years to get out there, it'd have to be kind of self-deflating. One of the things, so Lewis and Clark would split up on their way back. And when their return journey, they would take different paths. One would follow the Yellowstone and the other would follow the, the Missouri and, and venture off of it to some of its tributary rivers to explore more territory. It almost got them killed, uh, among other things. But one of the discoveries that they made was accidentally wandering through what would become Yellowstone National Park. Uh, would be some of the first Eastern eyes, um, Euro European, uh, her, with her European heredity to ever lay eyes on some of the thermal features that we now know of in Yellowstone National Park. In case you're curious, that's steamboat geyser erupting. It's the world's tallest geyser. It reaches heights of nearly 400 feet. It's an intermittent geyser. It erupts irregularly, but in our last significant period of time in the park in 2018, for some reason, Steamboat Geyser, which has gone as much as 60 years in recorded history between eruptions, began erupting much more frequently in 2018. Uh, we happened to walk in to the Norris Geyser Basin when it when it erupted one morning. So we got to see, see it. Uh, the ground was shaking under our feet and you hear a roar like a tornado. And I turned to Korean and I said, well, either something really exciting is happening or we're about to die. It's one of the two, there's no middle ground here. Uh, luckily for us, it was exciting and we got to see Steamboat Geyser. By the way, those in that picture, I, I used the panorama feature on an iPhone to take this specific picture. Those trees in the background are fully mature lodgepole pines. It just gives you an idea of how big that geyser is. It, it's four times, three to, depending on how high it goes, three to four times the size of Old Faithful. So shifting from the Lewis and Clark Trail to, and the parks that tell part of that story to the Western trails, the trails that tell the story of overland migration into the American West, one of the first sites that was created amongst those parks and, and very important to that history is in Fort Scott, Kansas. Fort Scott National Historic Site protects the original fort that was built to be one of the ring of forts built in an arc across the Eastern Plains as the permanent Indian frontier in the 1820s is when this concept was introduced and these forts started becoming a reality. The first problem with that was once they got the line of forts, which ran from Camp Snelling in Minnesota all the way to Fort Jessup in Louisiana. Camp Snelling, if you're curious, is right next to Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. It's still there. You can go visit it today. If you ever got a little bit of time and you're flying into or out of St. Paul, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's fascinating. But it's one of the sister forts along with Fort Leavenworth, which would later be well better known as a federal prison. Uh, and uh, a military location, and then Fort Scott to the south in southeastern Kansas. Fort Scott was one of this line of forts. By the time this series of forts had been built, the frontier was already west. It was already passed it by. So, so much for the concept of a permanent Indian frontier. That was uh, not very well, not a lot of foresight. Um, it sounded good on paper and in Congress. Um, Fort Scott would have several iterations of history, including being a, an important post for the war along the Kansas-Missouri border during the Civil War, the development of the railroads. For our intents and purposes, it was a very important army base and supply depot to protect the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, 
that's coming west, southwest, out of Independence, Missouri, through Kansas City, through southeastern Kansas, but it would be supplanted in importance to the Santa Fe Trail very quickly by Fort Larned, which would come up in 1860 and be, a, be serve as an army post from 1860 to 1878, uh, about, I'm going this from memory, but about 150 miles or so west of Fort Scott. So we're much farther to the west along the Santa Fe Trail, which runs right near where the fort is located. And this would be the main army post for army detachments that would patrol the eastern half of the Santa Fe Trail, would send detachments out to, to run. Of course, it was a hopeless task because any threats from, from hostile tribes or tribes that were at, inter, at times intermittently warring with the U.S. Army and took taking issue attacking wagon trains or merchants passing along the Santa Fe Trail, uh, they wouldn't attack a detachment of soldiers passing by. Uh, that, that would be suicidal. They would wait until there was a wagon train moving past without the soldiers, and those would be the ones that would, that would be high risk. Um, one of the major points of, of um, one of the major way stations, the most significant way station on the Santa Fe Trail was probably this point. Uh, it's Bent's Old Fort, now protected as part of Bent's Old Fort National Historic Site in southeastern Colorado. These are the dry desert tablelands of the Western Plains in southeastern Col Colorado. Uh, Bent's Old Fort uh, runs um, uh, right through the Santa Fe Trail passes right alongside the location of Bent's Old Fort. This fort you see is believed to be the same design and construction as the original fort, but the original fort was lost. Uh, so this is a reconstruction that's built by the National Park Service so people can visit the site and have an idea of what this fort looked like when it operated between 1833 and 1849. It was a pair of brothers, the Bents, the Bent brothers, one of which would go on to become governor of New Mexico before he was killed uh, in the early 1860s. Um, but uh, uh, the Bent brothers would operate this trading post and serve the function of supplying these trains that came through. They were headed uh, past this fort. Uh, this is what is left of Fort Union, which is now protected as part of Fort Union National Monument in northeastern New Mexico. Uh, again, the Santa Fe Trail runs right through this fort. There are original trail ruts that um, and actually, if you if you see this sign, part of the reason I use this picture is this sign is telling you to look down and you'll see original trail ruts from the Santa Fe Trail right next to that sign. Uh, but literally, the trail went right through Fort Union. Fort Union Trading Post, or Fort, Fort not, they're similar in name. Fort Union Trading Post is in North Dakota and Montana. Fort Union is the only one of 29 structures built as part of the third system of U.S. seacoastal defenses that is not, between 1815 and 1860, that is not on a seacoast. Because the total definition of that defensive arrangement by the U.S. government included land borders. And this was a post meant to protect the land border, which at the time of its creation was the, the, the Mexican-U.S. border. Uh, but principally, its function was to protect the Santa Fe Trail as a major army outpost in northeastern New Mexico. Very, very important as a supply depot for forward operations in the Civil War that hit New Mexico in the very beginning of the war, 1861 to 1862, which, which ended unceremoniously for the Confederates at Glorieta Pass about 60 miles away from Fort Union. This is where the, the Confederate Army under Sibley out of Texas were headed, was Fort Union. And, and the other, the next part down the line that tells part of that story is Picos, where the battle was fought. Picos National Historical Park, which protects a, an ancient 
Indian Pueblo, which was constructed right in the middle of this mountain pass, which clears through the Sangre, Sangre de Cristo Mountains in northern New Mexico. Uh, you can see the pass right in front of you in this picture. The modern day interstate uses it, as does the, the railroad, which was first brought through here in the 1870s, I believe. Uh, the railroad still uses the same right of way as does the interstate as the wagon trains on the Santa Fe Trail. And they all passed alongside this, this Indian Pueblo where this tribe took advantage of this major travel corridor and trading corridor and, and actually prospered for hundreds of years. Uh, they would go through times of, of prosperity and, um, and some depredation from their interaction with the Spanish, which began in the late 1500s. The Spanish would build a succession of mission churches at the park. I share this picture just because it's a beautiful view of Glorieta Pass itself, but we're standing in this picture on in the middle of the Civil War battleground. The Battle of Glorieta Pass would take place here in March of 1862, and it would all but end any Confederate attempts to claim New Mexico and Arizona in the American Civil War. A lot of people have called that battle the Gettysburg of the West, but it basically ended Confederate efforts to, to assume control of these territories out West in what we now call the American Southwest. And to this day, it remains the same major travel corridor as it had been for all of time since the first peoples passed through here almost 15,000 years ago. That story is told in detail at Picos National Historical Park, a fascinating, a, a park I consider to be a hidden gem for its many layers of history. Moving from, so the next stop obviously on the Santa Fe Trail is Santa Fe itself, which doesn't have a park unit in it. So to talk about the Western trails in the park system, we move north, we move to these four trails that run together through Nebraska and Wyoming until they split not far from the Utah-Wyoming border. One of the major landmarks that travelers through Western Nebraska would look for is this site, which is an affiliated site to the National Park System called Chimney Rock. Uh, you can see why they called it Chimney Rock. The actual rock was about 100 feet higher at the time of the, the wagon trains moving through in the 1840s and 50s. It has been eroded and some of it has fallen. So it's not quite as, and, and they estimate that based upon drawings that the early travelers left. So some of what we know about these sites, how they were used and how they evolve compared to how they appear now, we're, we actually, glean from the early records that some of the travelers took as they moved through these areas. But Chimney Rock was a very, uh, which is close to the North Platte River. Basically those four trails follow the North Platte River through Western Nebraska and into Eastern Wyoming. And they will cross through several national park units that are all about the, the history of those trails. Uh, first and foremost among those, this site. Uh, anybody recognize this? This is famous Scott's Bluff. It's protected as part of Scott's Bluff National Monument in Western Nebraska. Scott's Bluff, very recognizable promontory. Um, it, it was not only a major landmark along the California, Oregon, Mormon Pioneer and Pony Express trails, but it was also a bottleneck uh, because uh, part of the passage through here was only for quite a long time was only one wagon wide. So they would have to really push to get these wagons through. Uh, this rock is, is, uh, is, an, uh, is prone to erosion and these wagons uh, after hundreds pass through start to wear depressions and pretty soon you go from wagon ruts to a ravine. And until it was hacked out to a wider path, that's basically what you had going past Scott's Bluff here in Western Nebraska. So it became a, a bottleneck that they had to work around as well. As a result, they, they took some workarounds and the early variations of those four trails didn't, didn't pass right beneath the base of Scott's Bluff, but went a few miles to the west. That was the main path because this single lane path was so torturous 
until it was it was increased in size in the late 1850s. From Scott's Bluff, the next major site that they were looking for and expecting to to meet uh, would be one of their would be their last major supply depot before crossing the vast state of Wyoming. And if you've ever driven east to west across the state of Wyoming, not a lot there, even today. It's, it's pretty dry and desolate. And you can imagine doing it in a wagon train in the 1850s. There was nothing there but rattlesnakes. There is one spot that's really important to the history of the Mormon Pioneer Trail. I should add it to this presentation. Uh, that's in the middle of Wyoming called Rattlesnake Canyon. And uh, uh, it was really close to where one of the two spots where the Mormons with the handy carts got got stuck in the winter and had to be rescued uh, from with a group that came out of Salt Lake City. This is all part of the history of the Mormon Pioneer National Historic Trail. Anyway, Rattlesnake Canyon is right next to, to this location, and you can walk up to it from the, the Mormon settlement that exists there now. And uh, <laughs> the guy, the docent at the historic site, uh, which is run by the Mormon church, had, had said, um, uh, you can go and read the inscriptions of, of the passers-by since all four trails went through this, this path. Uh, a lot of them left their inscriptions on the rock, and I'm thinking, Rattlesnake Canyon, and I'm going to go up to the rock ledges and read the inscriptions. Um, no thanks. And sure enough, I walk up into the canyon, and what's sitting up on the first ledge that I look at? But a nice diamondback rattlesnake uh, cooling himself, getting out of the summer sun. Um, just a little side note, rattlesnakes have to find cool shade in the really hot parts of the summer because if they're out in temperatures above about 95 degrees, they'll actually burn to death. So it'll overheat because they're cold blooded. So they can't control their body temperature. So that's why they find these cool ledges. Not a good place to go rock climbing. Um, this particular scene is part of Fort Laramie National Historic Site, that last major supply depot headed west. And this particular part is one that a lot of people miss it is the original bridge constructed over the North Platte River, which runs right past Fort Laramie. It was constructed, it was completed in February 1876, just in a nick of time before the, the Sioux War of 1876, uh, which would result in the end of George Armstrong Custer and much of the 7th Cavalry, uh, parts of the 7th Cavalry that rode with him. Uh, on Last Stand Hill at a, another park unit. Uh, Fort Laramie would serve as a major U.S. Army post from its purchase. It started in the 1830s as a private trading post. Uh, these these uh, commercial um, interests went out west, established this fort, and made a killing on selling supplies to the small number of frontiers, fur traders, and other people that came through here in the early part of the 1800s. In 1849, the U.S. government decided they needed this post because of these overland trails and all the people passing through, and they were having problems with the tribes. And the, the, the famous Treaty of Laramie, two years later in 1851, would not settle that issue. It was hoped that that might calm some of the violence, and it did for a short period of time, and then it inflamed again, um, in doing no small part to the fact that the U.S. government this is actually an historic, a historical fact. They actually violated every one of the 700 or so treaties they signed with American Indian tribes. That's hard to do if you planned on it. Some 400 uh, or so of those treaties were ratified by the U.S. Senate, but all 700 that were signed were at some point and in some aspect of that treaty violated by the U.S. government or by American citizens. So it's a, a pretty consistent record of of of, um, and that's why you go and I've spent some time on on, uh, on tribal land, uh, trying to get to know the history from members of, of various tribes, uh, wonderful people uh, that I've encountered. But there's 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 still a deep level of mistrust that survives to to this day, and and we have some very important historical sites. Great example: Wounded Knee. The site of the Wounded Knee massacre is is uh, on the Pine River Reservation in South Dakota, 
that should be a national park unit, but it's not because it's on the nation's land and they do not want that story told by the US government. Like you are the guys who killed us here. Why would we want you to come back and tell the story? Hard to argue the logic, um, but it, it is a fascinating piece of history. Um, that same kind that at different aspects of the history of westward migration and conflicts with the tribes, all that entailed are told at Fort Laramie. In addition to this bridge, which is near the fort, uh, the fort has some original structures into including this priceless piece of history. This particular building was is the oldest structure standing in the whole state of Wyoming. Uh, it, these were the bachelor's quarters at Fort Laramie and it earned the name Bedlam. So if you've ever wondered where that was introduced into the American lexicon, here you have it. Um, this is where Bedlam came from. I'll also tell you where another phrase came from directly out of our history, uh, a little bit later from another park and its story. But uh, why well, I keep talking about original ruts on the Overland trails. This is a pair of, this is a set of them. This is, this is a set of original rag and ruts from the Oregon and California trails that run through Southern Idaho. In this particular park, they are protected as part of Hagerman fossil beds. And they're running up a hill. The fossil beds are actually in the side of this cliff uh, that are behind us. We're standing on the cliff looking down at these ruts. They had to run up this hill. You can see they didn't go directly up it. They kind of went up it from at an angle, um, making it a little easier. That's a lot of wagons. Uh, that passed over here. Um, and you saw from the graphic, uh, some 600,000 odd people in wagons uh, are walking, uh, are on horseback, passed over these trails and left these signs of their presence behind. One of the, um, the trails would split and you would have the primary trout of the trail and then all these cutoffs emerge. And if you get into the details of, of these historic trails, you have various cutoffs and, and the cutoffs sometimes become more popular than the main part of the trail. One of those cutoffs uh, for the Oregon Trail was the Goodell cutoff. And it usually always named after the first guys or people that went through and identified this as a, as a preferable route because it's a better source of water or easier to travel or some other, some other reason. One of the, uh, the Goodell cutoff for the Oregon Trail went right next to some mountains uh, right in, right along the base of the pioneer mountains between the pioneer mountains and a massive field uh, set of lava fields which is now protected in craters of the moon national monument and preserve craters of the moon sits along a 52 mile crack in the earth called the great rift this crack is 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 derived from some faults deep fault blocks in the crust a series of volcanic eruptions began uh, um, at times in, in a fountain like the Bellagio fountain in Las Vegas, can you imagine lava shooting up a thousand feet in a curtain of fire at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit? Um, you can prefer to get sprayed by the Bellagio fountains, but not this one. Uh, these, these eruptions at Craters of the Moon took place roughly in 2000 year intervals, but some lasted off and on almost a full millennium. Uh, geologists believe this still will this site will be active once more and there'll be future eruptions adding to the to the lava my wife here is coming out of a lava tube we use this picture in the book and the editor captioned it what comes out of a lava tube so now you know but uh, craters of the moon is quite quite fantastic um, a remarkable series of volcanic features that all have their origin at this massive crack in the earth the great rift uh, some future visitors to that park, when it becomes active again, are going to have a much more interactive park experience than they had counted on. After passing through southern Idaho, right when, when travelers would get into Washington State, they would find a major way station. The first couple from the east that traveled what would become known as the Oregon Trail were missionaries. They were part of the Great Awakening that took place in the 1830s in the United States. They believed it was their God-given duty to go out and share word of the Lord and the message of Christianity with the tribes in the West, who many of them had 
no exposure whatsoever to, to uh, Western society. And, and this first couple to do this uh, were the Whitmans. Um, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman would come out. They would stop in the eastern part of the state near modern-day Walla Walla and create a mission, a home uh, and some outbuildings here in this grove of trees that you see right next to the little pond. Uh, the, the original foundations of their mission and their home are down there in the ground. You can even see it if you look close enough, a few of those foundations are marked. Uh, the Whit Whitman first were a major, uh, a major aid to early travelers on the, on the trail. They, they settled here in 1836, built it up, and in the 1840s, the early travelers on the Oregon Trail uh, almost always stopped at the Whitman's mission and gained some sort of comfort or support or supply on their way to the Williamette Valley farther to the west. Unfortunately for the Whitman's, their story would end in tragedy in November of 1847. Some of these early travelers carried disease like smallpox and other disease which the tribes had no resistance whatsoever to. And uh, smallpox in particular wiped out many of the Cayuse tribe. They blamed Whitman's were the only European based people with that they knew. And so they they believe somehow they had brought upon bad spirits to uh, to cause all this death. And so they raided the Whitman's mission and killed them in November of 1847. Uh, but they were they were truly um, admirable people for the things they did for all the travelers and for the tribes. They had very good relations with the tribes, but uh, you know, fate took a, an ugly turn for them. The people traveling out on the Oregon Trail were headed here at the story this park tells. This is part of the uh, reconstructed version of the original trading post put up here in, in the 1820s, 1824, by the Hudson Bay Company. They would establish a trading post on the banks of the Columbia River in what is now Vancouver, Washington. And uh, the Park Service is reconstructed so you can see what it would have looked like when the Hudson Bay Company operated this fur trading post. Uh, the, uh, the post would be turned over once the border, at the time the Hudson Bay Company created this post, there was still a running debate about whether the border between Canada and the U.S. was at the Columbia River or whether it was farther north. That debate had been settled to a great extent, moving to the 49th parallel and its modern location uh, at, at the point two decades later when the Hudson Bay Company would turn over this location to the U.S. Army and they would establish Vancouver Barracks, eventually renaming this entire post Fort Vancouver in the early 1850s, in 1853 to be specific. Uh, this, this remained a, an active Army post uh, up until the time it was turned over to the Department of Interior and the National Park site in the National Park Service to become Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Grant served uh, the last of his time on the West Coast when he was in the Army at Fort Vancouver. And uh, his story, is long, along with many, many others, are told. Uh, one of the more interesting stories uh, is, the, is the man who ran that trading post, uh, John McLaughlin, another uh, ver uh, hero of of Oregon and Western Oregon and the story of the Oregon Trail. He was the chief factor at the trading post from 1824 at its creation to 1845. And uh, his home was a little bit farther to the south in the Williamette Valley in Oregon City. This is his home. You can visit it to this day. McLaughlin was central to helping these new settlers showing up settle to the south in this lush, very, um, prosperous valley that was great for agriculture, cattle, uh, raising livestock. So these settlers that did make it out to their destination found a wonderful environment in which to settle in. And it's still a beautiful place. If you go out and visit the Williamette Valley today, it's, it's still lush and full of, of life, uh, just as it was in the 1840s and 50s. McLaughlin paid, played a, a a paramount role in, in assisting these people in settling in the Williamette Valley. His house is a detached part of that National Park Service site, Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. On the California Trail, 
after the California splits with the Oregon Trail uh, and follows a different path through southern Idaho, one of the major stopping points that is now protected as a national park unit, these wagons sit out right, south, right outside its visitor center, is a spot that was named by one of these early travelers in 1851, the City of Rocks. They named it the City of Rocks because in the middle of nowhere of this beautiful rolling farming country in southern Idaho, you have what looks like a city of massive granite boulders that just sort of rise out of the ground from nowhere. It's actually a geological anomaly that caused the, this, this city of rocks of granite to, to form in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of nowhere. Now it's protected as part of City of Rocks National Reserve, co-managed by the state of Idaho and the National Park Service. It is a climber's paradise because you can find climbing in this park of every shape and variety from toddlers all the way to advanced technical climbers. Uh, also some wonderful hiking. Uh, the history is still recorded for us to see. Many of these early travelers on the California Trail left their name. These are original inscriptions from the dates you see. That's 1850, by the way, um, those dates. And 1859, there to the bottom right. Uh, they made those inscriptions in axle grease. And this weather, this granite's been exposed to the weather all these years since they left their, their signatures on this particular rocks called inscription rock, but they left, uh, they signed a number of the rocks uh, through this main travel area because the trail cut right through the middle of city of rocks. The gentleman that's credited with giving it that name is James Wilkins, and he was an early traveler on the California Trail. There are a couple of these gentlemen that signed this rock twice because they came through on two different trips. They went back and they led another, they led a wagon train through to California and they went back and led another one. Kind of part of the story that's been told in that 1883, for those who have seen that uh, great show. Um, of course, anything that Sam Elliott's in that's a Western is pretty awesome, you know. Hard to make a bad Western with Sam Elliott. Um, this, is, uh, this is the ultimate main stopping point for a lot of those people. Many of them would settle in the San Joaquin Valley, would, would get into agriculture. Uh, most, of the, most of the guys, the miners, prospective miners that were headed out did not make a fortune through that endeavor. Uh, the guys that supplied them did, uh, like Levi Garrett and some of the others. Uh, so you have some of America's most iconic co companies that, that call the California gold rush their, their origin. But uh, many were headed to, to, the, to the city by the bay, San Francisco. Uh, there are literally park service lands, National Park Service lands all around the San Francisco Bay. Uh, most of these in the city of San Francisco, including Alcatraz and its federal penitentiary and the Citadel, the Civil War era Citadel it sits upon, are part of Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Uh, you can visit those today. Fort Mason and Chrissy Field are off to our right, a little bit out of view, but uh, I'm actually standing on top of Fort Point, right underneath the southern anchor of the Golden Gate Bridge. That's where you're at in this picture. Uh, looking, looking across the beautiful city of San Francisco and Alcatraz and the Bay Bridge. Uh, it's hard to find bad scenery in San Francisco, isn't it? But a lot of people are not aware that much of the history in the city and along the Bayfront is protected as part of the national park system. The trails would come to an end in, in no small part due to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. The very first Transcontinental Railroad route was completed in Promontory, Utah on May 10th of 1869. After the Civil War ended, all of a sudden these men and materials flooded the West. Uh, the bill to complete this route was signed in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln, but the work was pretty much stalled until the end of the Civil War. Uh, but once it ended, the Union Pacific moving west from Omaha and the Central Pacific moving east from, from Sacramento, hacking their way through Donner Pass and the Sierra Nevada Mountains would eventually meet here in Promontory, Utah. This location is celebrated today and protected as part of Golden Gate National Historical Park. These are recreations of the engines that met on the, from the Union and the Central Pacific, respectively. 
The Union Pacific, as it crossed the plains, had this work detail of about 10,000 men. Graders went out ahead, but the track layers were the main body. Following them, because they had tracks laid behind them, uh, was virtual city on wheels. And given the working class backgrounds of many of these work gangs, they, uh, they had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of life in, in these traveling towns, including gambling, uh, alcohol, prostitution. And this is where the phrase hell on wheels came into the American lexicon. Uh, so if you ever wonder what hell on wheels means or where it came from, it came from the Transcontinental Railroad. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't take more than a decade in the 1870s for a whole new set of routes that competed with this main route to start populating and, and being built up in across the West, including through the Southwest. So you could get through to LA and you didn't have to go to Sac Sacramento or San Francisco and go South. But, um, that is the last of the parks that tell the story of the Overland migration. For those who are interested in learning more about, there's so much history in the national park system. Uh, in these 423 units, the 30 national trails, including those trails, the six trails we mentioned, are also part of the national park system. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about my story at the book's website, centennialjourney.com. I share some of the more than 60,000 pictures I've taken from throughout the parks. I do pictorial tours of various parks, the historical and the natural ones. Uh, I do that on the Facebook page for the book, uh, the first book. And then the, the nps.gov is a great base resource to learn about the park specifically and their current conditions. If you're, and for those interested in exploring the parks, that nonprofit club I mentioned, the National Park Travels Club is priceless. So um, yeah, the folks in there, uh, the, to just illustrate that, the first 18 months after I set the goal to see all the parks, I made it to maybe 50 new parks. Um, in 2000, March 2014, after I found that club and I had these people I could consult with and talk to, I would visit more than 150 National Park Service units in 2014 calendar year and do the same again in 2015. And then of course in 2016 made it to 387. So my, my, uh, exploration went directly up in proportion to exposure to people who were equally enthusiastic and could provide me with a little guidance. You know, no, I know just enough to be dangerous. That's what I, that's the best way I can describe it. Um, so with that, thank you for coming. Anybody has questions, I'll be happy to address them as best I can. Yeah. So uh, obviously there was a lot that was wonderful. Uh, in your estimation, what was the most underwhelming uh, of the sites that you visited where you just went, wow? Uh, you know, there's only one, if I'm being honest, I've gotten that question before, only one of the 423 I just didn't get, that didn't resonate with me as be, as to the point. So my goal in visiting all these places the first time was to understand why it was a park. Why was this place protected? Why is it that important? What does it have to offer, whether it's historic or natural? And I think if you get that essence, you're at a good place. That's a good place to start. That's not meaning I've seen the whole thing. The one park that I didn't get that, and I'll go back because maybe I missed it, is Ebby's Landing on, on Historical and Ecological Preserve on Whibby Island out in uh, Puget Sound, out in Washington State. Ebby's Landing is the spot, the park, is the spot where the old stone wharf set that, that took supplies on and off of Whidbey Island, which is beautiful. Whidbey Island des deserves visitors and tourists for sure. It's Deception Pass and it's just gorgeous. But, uh, but Ebby's Landing, I think for people from the Midwest, it's a, it's a couple of farm fields that are now separated by barbed wire fence and Maybe if you live in the Cascade Mountains or something, seeing a farm field is exciting. There's nothing left of the wharf or pier that used to be there, the landing. It's just a bunch of jumbled rocks on the shore. So there's an interpretive panel. So this is where Ebby's Landing used to be. I just didn't understand why that to me looked like the congressman from that part of Washington state uh, had some favors to trade and said, we need to get tourists on Whibby Island. And it helped. <laughs> 
because people will go to a national park site. Um, but I didn't get why that had federal protection. Might have made a cool state park, but yeah. Do you, no. How were the uh, trails uh, created? Or were they old animal trails, old Indian trails? What Most of them had their origin with the tribes. And the tribes, uh, when they could, they would follow the, uh, the, the animals. Um, and in some cases, that doesn't apply, like the great buffalo migration when there were 60 million bison roaming. Uh, the one across the plains from north to south with the seasons, they would, the million animals, that's not a trail. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a swath. That's a swarm of locusts that weigh 2,000 pounds moving across the plains. But a great example of that is Cumberland Gap. It's not part of these trails, so I didn't share it, but uh, it's in some of my other presentations. Uh, Cumberland Gap was originally discovered by bison that were migrating and crossed through the Appalachian Mountains. Yes, there were bison on the Carolina Plain back at one point in North America's history. And um, we know that because we found their fossils all the way on the Atlantic Coastal Plain. They discovered the Cumberland Gap. The bison did. Though the Indians were chasing the bison, and they go, they're, like, they're disappearing in the mountains. Uh, where are they going? Well, they're going someplace. Well, they figured it out. So they followed the bison. And followed, oh, there's a really cool path. It goes right through the Appalachian Mountains, right at the point now where Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee all come together. And so the, the, the tribes, Eastern and Kentucky, Tennessee tribes, Cherokee specifically, and others knew about that path and used it for trade and even warfare, for hunting. And then the early settlers like Daniel Boone, they followed the Indians. So one followed the other. And you've got many, many examples of that throughout history. Uh, there, there are some of these paths, many of the sections like the Oregon, the westward migration, the over, they called the overland migration that occurred in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s follow, parts of it follow old trails. They were, they were trails used for all those purposes, trading, hunting, and warfare. And um, more so for trading and hunting than warfare, because warfare, you don't exactly show up on the road. <laughs> it's not the best way to get there. You want to show up where they're not looking for you. Um, but yeah, the, the tribe started that, but in many cases, they fo followed animals when they could. So thought behind putting up these uh, forts. Was that to protect the people on the trail? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. And resupply them on the way, uh, absolutely. Because they're voters. And, and uh, either the settlers or the people supplying them have some clout, especially the people making money from all this. Ultimately, all that trails back to somebody in the East who's supplying all this all these commercial goods going out west, foodstuffs, supplies, metal goods, uh, arms, all going out west. And those people, you're starting to get into some of the aristocracy and people who have money and have influence. So yeah, this was, um, some of it was altruistic. Um, the, the stories of, which is a whole different topic, but the stories of warfare on the plains and farther west are horrific. And those stories would get back, and actually many of them were censored, uh, even for the history textbooks, because warfare, especially in those Indian wars that took place in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, was awful, brutal. Um, and both sides were brutal. It was very common for Plains tribes to mutilate corpses um, if, they, if they had a battle and came in possession, uh, like on Last Stand Hill with Custer. He and he was he and many of his soldiers were mutilated. Uh, that was left out of the um, history textbooks, uh, but it was in the old army reports. So the firsthand reports from the first soldiers that arrived and relieved the survivors, the Reno Benteen group, uh, they were the first men to see what was on Last Stand Hill, and they wrote in their reports exactly what they saw, and it was so awful and gruesome that it was not retold in, in history books, especially ones you find in a school. But yeah, so there's a, there's a big um, history um, and, and it doesn't take much exposure uh, 
to to that kind of you know, knowing that exists, you know, it just wasn't you were going to die. You were going to die very badly, and so that was the purpose of those those forts. But then there's a whole nother angle, you know. You can understand being. I mean, both sides did it. The army did it. So did the Indians. How did they propose to protect the uh, travelers? They actually rode along with the travelers, or only not not in some cases if there was a lot of hostility because you, you have to remember the hostility would 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 ebb and flow it would wane at times so there were there were safer years and there were deadlier years so they when you one of the topics of conversation or what are the current conditions on the trail how many raiding parties or war parties have have attacked wagon trains um how, how much hostility is along the trail and there were times when there were certain the, they would select a path because um, like the Bozeman cut off the Bozeman trail that went from Fort Laramie up into Montana. That was a very hostile trail uh, in parts of the 1860s and 70s. There was some serious warfare going on. So that was considered just unless you were going with an army detachment, you did not go. Um, is a good way to end up underground to go on that trail when when the Sioux were at war with the US Army. So it, it just varied. It was a different story year to year. And and you have uh, some tribes that have made peace with the government at different times and provide safe passage. And then a lot of times you had tribes that if that would would make friendly relations, but if you were passing through their land, they, they you know, they expected you to pay your respects. And and those that did and understood that had safe passage, and those who wanted to fight them every step of the way or or were hostile would get a very different reception, and would often find themselves in in a bad way. It's a fascinating history, really is, and um, I think the history of the West and that's a that's a of the twenty different classes courses and themes that I've covered international park system one of the ones I intend to do and I, I very much I look forward to it is one that delves into American Indian history as it relates to westward expansion um, it, it's connected to this pretty heavily but not it's a different topic altogether and it brings some different parks into that story but it's a fascinating study and one I think that we're we have better scholarship now than we ever have before. Um, there's there's more integrity to the scholarship, uh, and I'm not talking about revisionist history, but just more complete. You know, people have gone back. One of one of the better from that period. There is a book that was published in I reference in mine in 2015 about the Battle of Little Bighorn, that is the best thing I've ever read about those events. And the author of that book went back to those original army reports, went into Washington, D.C., found them, and took notes and got his information detail from the original reports that were filed by the soldiers under General Alfred Terry, which was the relief. He was Custer's superior. And Custer was supposed to wait before he initiated any, engaged any, hostile tribes until Terry and the main column had caught up. And this is part of the re I mean, my, my wife is, is Ms. Personal Responsibility. And, and when I took her to Little Bighorn and she absorbed the story, she's also very succinct in her assessment of things and brilliant mentally. But she said, looks to me like Custer got what he had coming, got what he deserved. Um, and, uh, that's a fair assessment uh, because he just did several things. He violated orders by engaging the enemy. He, he divided his force into three parts in the face of a superior enemy. Now, he didn't realize there were over 2,000 braves in front of him. But still, without, with, uh, with unknown hostiles and who are ready to fight and are good fighters and are defending their families who are with them, you're going to take your force and divide it into three parts. No, no, that violates basic military. That violates 
Military 101, Warfare 101 at, at West Point or Annapolis. Um, that's just something you do not do except in special circumstances. So that's all part of, that's another national park site, Little Bighorn Battlefield National Historical Site. Or no, National Monument, sorry. Little Bighorn Battlef Battlefield National Monument. See, even I can't always get the designation straight. They, they confuse the American public. So it's no, no, it's no wonder that people, you know, are not clear on it. And even the National Park Service knows that. They're like, we've managed to hopelessly confuse people with these naming conventions because uh, they had a purpose in the beginning, but now they've been adulterated. And, and now there's this image in the public that the national parks are designated by Congress are somehow superior to everything else and everybody wants to rename their park a national park. And uh, um, that's unfortunate because it undersells the other 360 units. And some of those units are profound experiences. Um, you visit, say, Flight 93 National Memorial and listen to the three recorded phone calls from the flight attendant and two passengers on United 93, uh, the last words they left for their loved ones and tell me if that's not a moving experience. Um, that's, that's one of the many things that you run into in our national park system and why it's so compelling because obviously that's a very different experience than Yellowstone or Yosemite. It's just something entirely different. But- well, I know this takes us on a little detour, but if you, um, if you only have, say, the weekend for Absolutely. So um, even here, first of all, for those who haven't seen Pullman National Monument, uh, go check that out. Go, go check out there. There's a newly opened of last, of Labor Day last year, Visitor Center in the old clock tower. Does a great job of presenting the story of Pullman, what happened, uh, how important that is in U.S. labor history. But the town itself is beautiful with the architecture. 95% of the original structures have survived. Uh, and well taken care of, it's embraced by the community. Um, I wouldn't go for a walk in Roseland next door, but if you stay in Pullman, you're in good shape. Um, uh, and, and then a little farther away, Indiana Dunes is now a national park, was National Lakeshore. Indiana Dunes is one of the most undersold. For me, it's one of my hidden gems. It's one of the most undersold national parks. So many people go there and they think they're gonna see the great sand dunes of Colorado or the Sahara Desert. And when they don't see something like this or it's limited in scope, they look at Mount Baldy or the dunes at West Beach and like, ah, oh, you know, this isn't much and there's steel mills on either side and they miss the whole thing. Uh, Indiana Dunes is one of the most ecologically diverse parks in our national park system. More species of orchid grow in Indiana Dunes than in all the Hawaiian islands combined. There are more birds, migratory and otherwise, that pass through or live in Indiana Dunes than in the Everglades. It's, I mean, you can go down the list. The architecture in, in and around Indiana Dunes is, is phenomenal. Uh, I addressed this. I wrote an article for those who might be interested that might help you as a guide to visit the dunes, um, the park, uh, called Logs to Lustrans, Sand to Swamp. And it's about both the architecture, history, and the, the uh, ecology of, of Indiana Dunes. The dune field from the south end of Lake Michigan stretches as much as eight and a half miles to the south of the current lake shore. So the towns of Chester and Porter are actually built on a dune field. The, the ancestral Lake Michigan has its origin from a glacier that stopped about 20 miles south of the current lake shore. You can go visit part of that terminal moray within the park at Pinhook Bog and the Upland Trail. So I talk about those things in that, that's in the online magazine National Park Traveler, but that's an easy day or weekend trip. Uh, you can go out there and take, bite off, you know, that's what my wife and I do when we want to just do a day excursion. She needs to get some fresh air. I'll take her to one part now I, you know now we're repeating hikes that we've done but we still found a few new ones because there are a lot of different areas in that park to explore and they each tell a part of the story and that's what makes it elusive is that it takes a lot of effort to peel back those layers things like the architecture you don't see that on a first visit most of the time 
I mean, you're lucky if somebody points out the Century of Progress homes that are right on the lake in Beverly Shores. Those are really cool. Uh, for those who don't know, they came from the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, and they're completely different in styles and architecture. Uh, they were intended to be possible designs for the future uh, from architects who are really trying to, to push the envelope. The House of Tomorrow, so in 1933, they were quite certain that by this point in time, all of us would have an airplane. So the House of Tomorrow is an airplane hangar in the bottom floor. Um, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, that's what they were thinking in 1933. You don't get it all right. Now that might have worked in, in Alaska. Uh, the uh, Lustrin homes, there are a number of Lustrin homes uh, that are, some are restored. Uh, and the Logs to Lustrins is a tour that's actually coming up next month. It's offered once a year by Indiana Landmarks. They take you through all this architecture, or a lot of it in the Indiana Dunes National Park. It, it's, it, it's a fascinating tour, really great way to spend a day. Uh, it's usually on a Saturday. Um, but they, uh, they take you to a couple of Lustrin homes. Lustrin Corporation was a company that started it right after World War II, based in Ohio. They had the idea they were gonna meet the housing boom after World War II with all metal homes that were prefabricated and, and assembly line homes. There, there would be in over 30,000 different parts. They would truck them to the point of the, the house, the construction, and they would put them together on site with a team and you know, economies of scale would drive the price. Well, they never made enough to get economies of scale. Uh, and they had some tragic miscalculations. One being, you think about it, an all metal home in the winter, um, the, uh, the couple from Valparaiso who has a fully restored Lustrin home in the park that they visit on that Logs to Lustrin's tour, they stay in the summer in their Lustrin home and Valpo, they stay in Valpo in the winter. And they say, if you walk into this house in the winter, it is literally like walking into a freezer. Because the metal, you know, how are you gonna insulate that? The answer is you cannot. You cannot put enough insulation on the inside of that house because it's all metal. So it just, it's like an ice box. But uh, yeah, all kinds of little things like that. Those would be the two places I would start and then go out from there. And, and, and um, you know, look for, one of the reasons I wrote that first book was to introduce people to the whole national park system so they would know that there are places you can reach. You know, going west, there's a really cool park called Effigy Mounds that's on the Mississippi River and right across from Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. You can visit that and see a lot of it in a day. And, and if you want to make it kind of a cool weekend trip, that's easily doable from here. Um, Chicago is a great place to be based on to explore the whole park system, but it's certainly far from ground zero. But I'm glad I was here when I did that because I, would, I had to fly quite a bit too. And if you're trying to get to Guam, it's pretty hard to get there from the middle of Wyoming. Um, easier to get to Yellowstone, but, but uh, not Saipan, Guam, and American Samoa. Thank you for coming. Um, appreciate it. Thanks.